Welcome to Lard TV, and we're back in the second of uh, this short series looking at Infamy Infamy and some of the armies that uh, are included in the rules. Um, today we're going to have a look at the Germans, one of the most interesting forces and probably if you think about barbarians in the ancient world, these guys are the prototype. They are probably the most aggressive and the most straightforward of armies, but there's still lots of variety we can have in there, uh, as we will see when we have a look at the specific army lists. Now let's have a look at uh, the group sizes that go to make up the army. Uh, we talked yesterday about the Romans and how they tend to be grouped in eights. Well, here we go uh, with the barbarians. You can see here a group of barbarian warriors, and they are in tens. Now somebody asked about uh, unit frontages and uh, uh, we are basing ours on a uh, four figure frontage for the Romans uh, which is on the 10 centimeter frontage, four inch frontage if you prefer um, and yet we are using that pretty much as the standard unit frontage. Does it matter? No. Uh, basically what happens when you get into combat, one group will conform with another group. So if the base sizes are different, it really doesn't matter at all. But for us, as we started out with our armies from scratch and didn't have any issues about rebasing or anything like that, we've just gone with the standard uh, frontage and the uh, uh, bases that uh, we have for the uh, barbarians. Um, we have the uh, war, war bases have very kindly made us some infamy mob bases. Um, when the rules are published you'll see that the uh, whilst the Romans can operate in formations, the barbarians can operate in mobs. They work slightly differently because we've got two very different sides of uh, the coin there. So let's have a look at uh, the, the uh, units here now. So we've got 10 figure units. Now that's going to be for all warriors, whether they are levy or whether they are uh, regular warriors or elites. Um, we can then have a look at the skirmishers. Skirmishers uh, are in sixes um, because they are tribal skirmishers. We saw that with the Romans when they introduced their Balearic slingers because they're not auxiliary troops and part of the regular Roman army, they are in a tribal formation, as again we actually saw with the allied warriors. So we're seeing a replication there. Um, some, Roman, uh, sorry, some Germans, however, do come in groups of eight. Quite unusually, um, these are the Roman Federati. Now, these are Germanic troops who've served uh, with the Romans as auxiliaries, uh, but who've returned to their tribes, be it having finished their 25 years service or having deserted and re returned to their tribes. Um, and these guys come in eight figure units, very much organised as the Romans, and they retain a large degree of their Roman training so, and armour actually. So they're quite, quite impressive troops. One of the things you'll find with the Germans is they have very little armour. Even their elite uh, household warriors uh, are lightly armoured. Uh, Germany was quite a primitive uh, place at this point in time and the ability um, uh, with regards to metalworking was, was quite rare. Indeed, as you put your army together for the Germans, you should see that the vast majority of them are armed with spears. Um, the Germans very much focused on that. If you think of a Gallic warrior or a British warrior having a sword as being the equivalent of having a BMW or a Jaguar. For the ancient Germans, having a sword was the equivalent of having a Rolls Royce or a Maserati. It really was a sign of incredible wealth 
and incredible nobility. So we see very, very few of them um, in this uh, German force, and in fact the only ones we really see with the Germans who've got reasonable armour are those federati who've got their chain mail uh, shirts that they brought back from Roman service. Uh, we can have a look at cavalry. Cavalry, Germanic cavalry, famed for their aggression, albeit on rather small mounts, which means that they are a bit slower than normal cavalry, but nevertheless, uh, Caesar reckons they could uh, see off uh, fairly large numbers of Gallic cavalry, so um, uh, these guys are not to be sniffed at. So we can see they come in groups of six. So, just to recap, you've got ten for your uh, warriors, you've got eight for any federati previously trained by the Germans, you've got six for your skirmishers, six for your cavalry. Now, there are some other things that you need when you're fielding a uh, German force, uh, and indeed any force. Uh, these are ambush points or deployment points. We put these on 60mm round bases, and effectively these represent points in terrain, so for example in the woods or in swamps or um, uh, you know, uh, in, 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 in the mountains, where the enemy could emerge from. They are essentially points of threat that the Romans have to respond to. Now we talked um, in the last film about how the Romans would need their allied uh, tribal units and their cavalry units as a way of um, shutting down, hopefully, these uh, ambush points or deployment points. Uh, so scouting for the Romans is very important indeed. One of the reasons why, if you just simply take a big legionary force, you're not going to uh, be overly successful because your scouting capability is much more limited. So it's far more important to have a balanced force to overcome these uh, and shut these down and hopefully have some idea of where the enemy threat is going to be coming from. Now, these are a great opportunity. Let's have a look at some of them. These are a great opportunity to produce some lovely little vignettes. Depending on the nation that I've done them for, um, I've done them in slightly different ways. So the, the, the Germans here have got some priestesses, and they've got some warriors and standard bearers. So they, they're, um, they're quite attractive little pieces to have on the table. And I think that's one of the, the pleasures of uh, having a force that's relatively small is that it's not too much of a chore to add these add-ons that really uh, make the table look attractive. So, um, <coughs> there we have it. Uh, you'll need six of these ambush and deployment points. It may be that you're not deploying them all. In some scenarios, for example, if the Romans are raiding across the Rhine into uh, uh, Roman... Uh, sorry, if the Germans are raiding across the Rhine into Roman territory, they certainly won't have as many of these. They're likely only to be using one, two, maybe three if they're very lucky. But if the Romans are moving in, into German territory, this is a lot scarier and they're going to be faced with a lot more points of potential threat because they're advancing into the unknown. So, uh, six of those as an absolute maximum. Uh, and that really is our core force. Now we're going to have a look at uh, the first of our army lists here, uh, which is Germans of the Rhine tribes. Um, and I'll, let's have a look here. We can see this is uh, quite a nice force. Uh, we've got uh, five uh, units of warriors, one of which is elite. You can tell them by their swords. You've got one unit of six skirmishers and uh, you have got a supernumerary leader, and uh, that's it. Uh, so the first uh, group of three warriors has got uh, one elite group and two ordinary warrior groups, and they are led by the warlord and another secondary leader, and then the other two groups of warriors are led by a uh, status two leader. Um, obviously, that's a force you're going to be able to add troops to. This would come in at about 120, 125 points. <coughs> Excuse me. So, if you remember, when we looked at our Roman legionary force, that was, that was around 140 points. So, you're going to have options here in terms of adding additional support units to this. So, if you're facing the Romans, you're probably more likely to have numbers. But this is quite a nice little force in terms of painting. You've got five groups of ten, that's 50. You've got one group of six skirmishers. 
brings it up to 56, and you've got three leaders, 59. So whilst the Romans were at 50 figures uh, for the Imperial Force, the first one that we saw, these are only at 59 figures, um, so that's not too hectic a force to paint up. Now, let's have a look at the next uh, force for the Germans. This is the Germans from Germania Magna. These are the guys who don't live near the Rhine, uh, and consequently don't have so much uh, contact with the Romans. Uh, their force, as we can see here, is one group of elite warriors. They've got two groups of warriors, and again, they've got very similar, because the, these, the, these uh, guys, the, one of the main differences here is going to be the type of support options they can choose. Um, so they've got uh, uh, the three groups, one group of elite, two groups of warriors, and then you've got um, one group of fanatical warriors. Now they are in groups of six. Uh, these guys are your typical prototype, hairy naked barbarians who rush out and uh, uh, frothing at the mouth and uh, hack people to bits. Uh, are very much used to try and disorder the Roman force. Um, and then alongside that, you've got some javelin skirmishers uh, who are lightly armed skirmish troops and again with a super numerary leader. Uh, that uh, is your force of Germania Magna. It's quite a small force that comes in at under 100 points. So again, if you choose this, you're going to have a bit more flexibility in terms of deciding what additional support troops you want to add to this. And if you like to pimp your force, you know, you want to be using cavalry or you want to be using um, more groups of um, uh, different types of warriors, then this is a force that's going to be a good base for you that allows you to, to use that. And that's going to be the type of force that the Romans would be bumping into um, when they were advancing across the Rhine and campaigning deep into uh, what's now Germany and even Czechoslovakia itself. Uh, Czech Republic, blimey, show me age there. Okay, let's have a look at a third force. This is an interesting and fun one. Revolting Federati, we call this. Uh, this very much is inspired um, by the revolt of uh, Julius Civilis and the Batavians in the year AD 69. And you can see here that we've got three groups of eight Federati troops. They've got two leaders, which means they've got a lot of leadership, hard-hitting force, which we can see here, uh, deployed in the Cuneus, the Wedge Formation, Boar's Head, Swine's Head, whatever you want to call it. And alongside them, they've got two groups of Germanic warriors. Uh, the, uh, when the Batavians revolted, they uh, went to the local allied tribes who joined them as well, but obviously not as well drilled, but still super aggressive troops and then alongside that you've got a group of six Federati cavalry. Now the nice thing here as you can see from that force is that you're going to be able to use your Roman auxiliary troops as Federati if you want. I've actually done a bit of a conversion job here so if you're using something like the 28mm Victrix figures you could take the basic Roman auxiliary figure but change the head to be one of the uh, Germanic uh, warrior heads that they have and all of a sudden you've got a completely new figure or as I say you can retask uh, the uh, auxiliar who you've got in your Roman army armies to serve alongside some German troops. Um, that's nice, just gives you a bit of an option. You can see again that you can use the same figures for the uh, tribes from the Rhine as you can for the armies of Germania Magna, as you can for the, tr the tribesmen who are allied to the revolting Federati. That means you're going to be able to, for a relatively low output in terms of figure painting, you're going to be able to get multiple armies that operate you know, in quite different manners. So, let's have a look and talk about what other units you're able to, going to be able to get uh, as support options um, and then also look at some of the specialist support choices that you're going to have with your army. Now, obviously um, the 
uh, Germans are going to be able to have the normal cho choices of warriors to support their uh, basic force. So you're going to be looking at your elite household warriors, oath sworn warriors, uh, warriors of the hundred, Tacitus refers to them as. Uh, you're going to have your standard uh, Germanic warriors. You're also going to have your levy, um, who are troops who um, are probably you're going to want to keep in a second line supporting rather than actually in the front line fighting. But nevertheless, they're the guys there who can play their part in the fight. You're going to have a number of skirmish options. Uh, you've got the Germanic slingers, obviously, you've got the javelin men, you've also got the woodland archers. Germans don't have a lot of archers. It's one of the things we don't see referred to in um, uh, any of the Roman histories of this period. You tend to find uh, Germanic archers coming in in a couple of hundred years' time. Um, but at this point in time, they can choose archers who are woodland archers, who are basically huntsmen. Uh, who have been retasked to hunting human beings rather than, uh, rather than animals. So that's an option there. We've obviously got our frothing at the mouth, um, uh, wild warriors in there as an option. We've got federati, we've got federati cavalry, and we've got Germanic cavalry there as well. Um, so that's the, the initial types of options we've got. What else have we got? Well, we've got a number of uh, support options that the Germans can use. Like the Romans uh, that we looked at in the last video who got the opportunity to build fortifications, one of the things that the Romans have is uh, the opportunity to build what we call Arminius's Wall. Arminius, at the, uh, commanding at the uh, Battle of the Teutobergerwald, uh, was able to trick the Romans by building what was effectively a wall or a dike behind which he hid troops. So that's an option. The good thing about it is you don't have to model it or paint it up. It simply allows certain deployment options from low standing terrain. So basically it's a means of cloak, cloaking some of your deployment. One of the other things that, uh, that we have are, uh, there's a German option which is unique, are the Wailing Women. Um, now these are uh, taken directly from Tacitus, uh, who says that many a German army on the point of rout and retreat has been rallied by seeing their women folk exposing themselves and saying, right, um, if you don't fight on and save me, I'm going to be in Roman captivity. And we can see uh, them exposing themselves in a uh, manner as quoted by Tacitus, uh, clearly to serve as an aid memoir on what they're likely to be missing out on. Uh, and no further comment required, I think. Um, uh, you've also got uh, options such as musician or a hornsman able to uh, extend the command radius of a leader. Um, and one of the things that uh, we're also going to be looking at uh, in one of these uh, videos is some of the people who can join a leader's uh, force as uh, extras, so to speak. So um, we're not, we're not going to go into that at this moment in time, but there are going to be some other characters that it's possible to add to a German force, and we're going to look at that in a particular program. But that gives you a basic outline of uh, how a German force is likely to be put together. Um, Whereas the Romans are disciplined and uh, solid in their fighting, uh, the Germans are probably the antithesis of this. They are the most aggressive force that uh, you're likely uh, to see. Their, their prime weapon is um, a fear and surprise, um, <laughs> predominantly surprise. Their ability to ambush out of the woods, of course, is legion. Um, they're also relatively fast-moving. Uh, we can often see that the German infantry can operate as what we call in the rules foot cavalry, very much in the way of the Scots Greys at Waterloo, where they advance hanging on to the, um, hanging on to the mane of the cavalry's horse, and thereby able to deploy infantry across the table combined with cavalry in a very, very rapid manner. No chariots for the Germans, but by using their cavalry in that manner, in tandem with the infantry, they can uh, steal a march on their enemy and move pretty rapidly around the table. Um, and of course, they've got lots of aggression to go with that. Uh, their ability to rally back and reform on the Wailing Women is something that uh, 
gives them uh, a longevity that means they're not just a one-shot wonder. So, who would like an army like this? Well, somebody who likes naked men with, um, with large swords, uh, but somebody who likes to play an aggressive game, possibly a waiting game, luring the Romans into deep into your part of the table before launching your attack. Um, so, there we have it. Germans, very, very different to the classic ancient war game where barbarians are just rated as barbarians, as we'll see when we look at the Britons and the Gauls, who are very, very different indeed um, in the way that they operate, fight, and their units are structured. Hopefully that uh, gives you an idea of uh, how you can put your German force together. The figures we're using here are uh, foundry. Their range of ancient Germans is absolutely superb, but um, obviously you've got ranges from people like Victrix as well. Um, but the big emphasis is on making sure, if you want to go historically, if you don't, it doesn't really matter, um, but if you want to go historically, these guys are big on the spear department and not so much on the swords. So, there we go. Hopefully that's been of interest. We'll be back soon to have a look at another force. Um, I think maybe it might be fun to have a look at the Caesarian Romans next. Uh, before we look at the Britons and the Gauls, because obviously the Caesarian Romans are more than ready to fight both of those um, opponents. So, there we have it. Thanks very much for watching. And again, take care of yourself in these very unusual times. And we'll look forward to seeing you on Lark TV again very soon.